The brothers who took a stand for their faith and lost their TV show because of it. David and Jason Benham say God can use your boldness and your brokenness. Plus, are you content? Daniel Ritchie says he is, even with no arms. Find out how you can be too on today's 700 Club Interactive. Welcome to the show. Here's Ephraim Graham with this week's Top 5 from Studio 5. At number 5. Good evening and welcome to the 1 millionth Academy Award. Snapshots and moments to remember from this year's Academy Awards. 29.6 million viewers watched the Oscars Sunday night, an 11% increase over last year. Diversity, also a big winner Sunday night, with Regina King of Beale Street Could Talk and Mahershala Ali of Green Book clinching Best Supporting Oscar wins. God is good all the time. Spike Lee won his first ever Academy Award for his Black Klansman screenplay. And in the much anticipated Best Picture category. And the Oscar goes to Green Book. Green Book, the segregation era road trip drama crowned Best Picture. At number four. It's not easy being queen. Queen Latifah graces this year's Oscar stage. But the star is scoring an even golder moment back in her hometown of Newark, New Jersey, making a splash of headlines for a multi-million dollar housing investment she's making in the city. In a couple years, this empty block on Springfield Avenue is expected to look like this. Just another day living in the hood. That $14 million plan for Latifah's old hood includes 23 family townhomes and a 76 unit apartment building with at least 16 affordable apartments. Queen as I'm um, always represented, Newark and East Arm. Yes, I think it's good. This development is expected to begin to open up by December of 2020. And the Queen's building project may not be the only one coming to Brick City. We have been having ongoing conversations with uh, a few other celebrities, so kind of stay tuned. At number three. We got the beat. Yeah. It's in our feet. Yeah. It's in our head. Yeah. It's everywhere. Run the race. Tim Tebow's first theatrical film opens in the box office in the top 10. What do you think your fiance's first feature film? I, I mean, I couldn't be more proud, but most of all, I am so proud of the reason um, and the meaning behind this film. And um, hopefully that is to bring people closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've coached hundreds of kids, man. I've never met kids like these boys. And they've been dealt a tough hand. And they've been through a lot. But somehow it managed every single day to make it. At number two, another newcomer to the film industry. Today is your moment to shine. Don't show us what you've got. Show us what you've been given. So do I have a second call back? These are scenes from Bethel Music's Bright One's first feature film. I don't want to perform. I think this is your time to be seen. Do you want to write this weekend? Gentlemen. Principal Franken. Bright Ones is in theaters nationwide for one night, April 22nd. You ever wonder about your real parents? Nobody wants the old dog from the pound. At number one. You got dead now, Mabel. Damn, damn. Didn't eat no pork. And look at it. We done outlived it. Laying there dead. And we still alive. Are you satisfied? It's the end of an era for Tyler Perry as Medea. This is the last Medea film. It's been a wonderful run. I'm so grateful. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm turning 50, and I certainly don't want to be her age playing her. So uh, I think she's had a great run, and I'm really grateful for it. It's the last Medea movie and play. Perry's been traveling the country with Medea's farewell tour. Is he here? And this week, he stops in New York City to premiere a Medea family funeral. It's been a good run. Some, some thing, all good things must come to an end. And a lady always knows when to leave, so she knew to leave. Yeah, you have to go to court. I don't go to court, okay? I'm dragged to court. I don't just go to court because the judge said go to court. I'm a thug. Well, Ephraim joins us now, and where do you, where do you, let's start with the Oscars. Okay. Um, <laughs> any surprises from your standpoint? Um, 
Not really. I guess uh, I was really grateful to see what Black Panther did manage to score. Um, it was first a uh, first for at least two two African Americans. We saw uh, one woman take home the award for best set design. Uh, I believe her last name is Bleacher. And then we saw Ruth Carter, uh, who is a graduate of Hampton University, which is right here in our backyard. Oh, yeah? She take home the Oscar for uh, uh, best costume. Uh, that was like I think her third nomination, which was also great. We saw Spike Lee take home um, best screenplay. I don't think anybody. I was more excited about that Oscar than he was jumping in the arms of Samuel Jackson. Um, and I uh, think it was you, definitely... You can say it's about time. Yeah, about time for him. He's, time. he's been at this for a while. Uh, Regina King gave a, a really moving speech. Her mom was there in the audience. Her mom is a teacher, uh, was a teacher in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, obviously a family of faith, and we heard that in her speech uh, repeatedly as she said, you know, thank you, Mom, for telling me that God has always been leaning in my direction uh, and God is indeed good all the time because mm -hmm. she's been in the business for a very long time, since a child, and it's so hard for a child actor to start as young as she did and to stay in the industry as long as she has. And to stay sane. And to stay sane. Um, family woman, a mother herself, um, divorced, but still raising her her, her son um, and making a difference. I mean, she had think this year she committed that uh, I think 75% of the projects she is going to do from here on out or she is going to see to it that there are more women working behind the scenes than ever before on her projects and she challenged other women to commit to the same thing just to make sure that filmmaking becomes even more diverse uh, and to see her win an Oscar it was about time glad to were see you that. surprised with Green Book um, I, I guess I, I was kind of torn. Everyone was saying that I think it was Roma was going to win instead. Um, but Green Book is, is, is a powerful film. Um, although I you know, really liked it. I did like you it. Said I it did like it. Show. Yes, I really did like <laughs> you it. Really did like uh, it. It's, it's a great film. I mean, it taught me things that I didn't know. Um, and then I had to go back and then start asking my family, I was like, well, you guys never told me about a Green Book. There was a Green Book. And I learned new things. Uh, and the relationship between these two, I mean, two real life characters uh, and the, the the concert pianist shared his story with filmmakers before and said, you can't make the film, though, until I die. Mm. So after he died, they died just months apart. So they were friends for a very long time. And then to see this play out, um, it was really good, Re really good to see. And there, was some controversy over there. there was some controversy. There was some controversy. His Lee. family, yes. Spike Lee didn't like it because he said that it, it was a story that's been done before. Um, he compared it to Driving Miss Daisy, mm -hmm. um, the whole idea and of... And he lost in that one, too. And he, he lost in that one, too. So maybe that was just personal. <laughs> yeah. Because anytime there's a story <laughs> about somebody driving somebody, somebody, driving else. somebody I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win. Um, and his fa his family, the, the the concert pianist family, did not necessarily um, like the film, but they said it didn't wasn't because um, it wasn't truthful. There were just elements of his life that they wanted to see included that weren't there. For mm -hmm. example, part of his reason for touring the country the way he did was to go to hysteric, historically black college and universities to perform, to expose those children to the work that he was doing. Uh, and we did not see that in the film. Yeah. That was something that, that was they wished yeah, left out. that was left out. The whole why are you doing this right. was also left out. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that would have filled in that gap. Absolutely. This is why you're doing it. You're yeah. going to these other places mm -hmm. where there's still open discrimination, and you're right. doing that to pay the bill right. so that you can go mm -hmm. to the black colleges yes. and show those kids, What's here, possible. Here, here's what you can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Tim Tebow is going into the film business. Yes, he is. And a great first run. This project for him has been seven years in the making. Uh, for the actual gentleman who wrote the film, it was 10 years in the making. Tim Tebow and his brother came along three years in. Uh, and I'm then some projects go, <laughs> go three years. I think that's forever. Yeah, I know. And you're going to do 10? Yeah, he, he was at this for 10 years. And he said, uh, I had a chance to talk to him on the red carpet as well to ask sort of where did this story come from? Uh, and was it true? True. And he goes, well, what it was was where he grew up. He took elements of things that he saw so he could tell you any part of that story. He can say, well, that's actually my friend this and that's my brother going through this, um, which is significant tragedy um, that unfolds in the film. Don't want to give too much away because it's still in theaters. People can certainly go see it. you want people to go see it. I want you to go see it. Uh, and it is a first great run for Rob and Tim Tebow. And yeah. he said in the interview, because I think I asked, I said, so you, you've done one. Will you do this again, even though this isn't what you intended? And he said he absolutely would do it again. Yeah. It's hard work, he admits. He goes, seven years for him, 10 years for the filmmakers. Hard work, but they do it again.
Well, that's sort of the untold story. Everybody has the dream of standing on the stage, <laughs> yes. holding the golden statue, <laughs> but you don't realize the sheer amount of work that goes into it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is some of the hardest things. You know, I thought I knew about live TV. Then yeah. I thought, okay, let's take on animation. Mm -hmm. But then you start doing feature films. It's a different level. It is indeed. And talking to people who are working with the film, they go, well, you know, you may think it's a big deal. They got it in 10 years. I've got projects that I'm still sitting on the shelf that I'd like to see come to fruition. Well, sitting on the shelf. Mm, yeah. I'm sorry, that didn't count. <laughs> no. If you've been working hard on it for 10 years, Absolutely. Then that's a different thing. And they were nonstop on this one. All right, what do you think of Bethel Music? They're coming out with one, too. It, is, uh, it, it looks good. I'm actually screening it right now. I'm about halfway through the, through the film, so when I leave here, I'm going back to my desk to finish the film. Um, it's beautiful because this focuses on Bethel kids, essentially. Mm -hmm. Bethel Music's children's department. Uh, it's one that I will certainly push for the children in my own church to see um, because it celebrates uh, being creative and using your creative juices to bring glory to God, uh, which is something I don't think we necessarily focus on uh, enough. I would say most churches don't focus not, on that. Not enough. Um, and I'd like you know, to see You keep that. hearing the story. I started in the church right, choir. Right. You keep hearing that. Right. And then for whatever reason, churches aren't getting that right. to say, well, okay, let's be very intentional with our children. Mm -hmm. And let's let's walk them through a um, you know how do you do this? All right, Bethel gets that. They're helping to tell that story with this movie, and I think it should encourage us all to do that. I'm certainly going to go back to my own congregation uh, and begin to look at our children and are say, you, okay, how gonna, can we do this? You're going to criticize? Your Not going to criticize. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to. You're going to be constructive. I'm going to be constructive. Let's build figure out how we can how yeah. we can make this work. F from the edi <laughs> F from the edifier. Yes, you got it. All right. Well, for all the latest in entertainment news, you can check out Ephraim's The Edifier weekly show. It's called Studio Five. You can watch it on the CBN News Channel or online at cbn.com slash studio five. And Ephraim, thanks again for being with us. Good to be here. Well, coming up, they've played professional baseball and started multi-million dollar businesses. Now these brothers say they want to build a bridge between heaven and earth. David and Jason Benham join us live to explain right after this. Well, baseball players turned real estate tycoons. David and Jason Benham are known for being bold. Still, they say when it comes to winning people to Christ, boldness is only half the equation. I'm Jason Benham. My name is David. Our the business, business is named after me. That business is the Benham Companies. It's a multi-million dollar real estate empire founded by twin brothers David and Jason Benham. In 2014, the twins made headlines when they were hired, then fired, by HGTV because of their stance against same-sex marriage and abortion. Today, the Benhams encourage Christians to stand in the gap for their faith and others and explain why we need to be that vital connection between people and God in their book, Bold and Broken. Well, Jason and David are here, and welcome to the show. Thanks We've got a new book us. out, Bold and Broken, Becoming the Bridge Between Heaven and Earth. All right, so Jason, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> this book came out of a conversation with a molecular biologist? <laughs> Actually, no, but no? that is a great <laughs> chapter in the book that talks about that cell adhesion molecule inside of our bodies called laminin. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that, I mean, it literally gels together cells and it keeps them connected to our muscle tissue. And the, 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 the pattern of that molecule is in the shape of a cross. And so I didn't have the conversation. It was something I got from Louis Giglio. But man, that is phenomenal how the cross brought the connection. Okay. And so that's the, the bridge. That's right. It's the adhesion that holds everything together. Yeah. And so as I, I was up early one morning praying, thinking about Ezekiel 22, you know, where God said, I'm looking for a man to stand in the gap. And I prayed through the Lord's prayer. And then I got to the part where it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I thought about that gap. Then I thought, you know, in today's cultural context, the importance of Christians standing boldly for their faith, to stand in that gap, it takes boldness. But we wrote the book to show Christians through story that there are ditches on both sides of that road. Boldness apart from brokenness makes you a bully. 
we've we found some folks that are that have been there and, and we've been in that in, the, in that ditch as well but on the other side and this is where a lot of christians find themselves is that brokenness apart from boldness makes you a bystander so the ditch on either side of the road is that you can be a bully on one or a bystander on the other what david and i say in this book is that your boldness needs to be fueled by your brokenness and when you do that you will discover you become a bridge between heaven and earth and you actually become the answer to the prayer that we pray your kingdom come Come, your will be done on earth as you it is. You become that cross. You become you that. Take up that yeah. cross. The continued you continued connection. Around. All right, Dave, we're going to let you talk now. Okay, no, don't let you. him. No, finally. <laughs> he we're talks all the time. Finally. Finally. Good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, let, let's get into one of the stories. Right after you got bounced off TV, yeah. you got a, a message yeah. from someone that was just yeah. scathing. We had hundreds of thousands of messages coming to us, and especially on Facebook and the Messenger. and. And for some reason, I know it was just the Holy Spirit. I remember I, I popped open my cell phone. We had probably been fired three or four days. And, and uh, I just saw this one message and it was from a young man in Chicago. And he said things about Jason and me I never even knew existed. I mean, it was just horrible things. And, and the Holy Spirit really just softened my heart for him. Instead of trying to win a mm. point, you wanna win a person. And so I just simply said, bro, I think you're speaking through your pain. Well, the next message he sent to me was almost like a book. I mean, I, I just read and just all that he just poured out his life story and the abuse and these things and my heart really broke for him. So that started a conversation over about a two day period of time. And I found out during that conversation that he's a huge Chicago Cubs fan. So I reached out to Jason. I said, hey, man, let's put him on the front row. The cards are about to be in town. Let's send him a little. Let's go on a stub hub, buy some tickets, send him a link and put him right on the front row. And so we did that. And he was blown away. He couldn't believe. He's like, I can't believe you guys are doing this for me. Well, a couple did, of days did later. the Cubs win? Uh, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, I should know that. It's so I mean, bad. The cards they played town. the Cardinals. No, cards they probably sure didn't. I'm sure if they were playing the Cards, they lost. <laughs> well, a couple of days later after the game, he uh, responded back to me, and he, and he sent me a, an email. And, and in it was a link to a Mercy Me song, I can only imagine. And he said, hmm. for the last two days, he said, after you guys sent me those tickets, I have been listening to this song over and over again. And I am so overwhelmed by God's love that I've chosen, he said this, to surrender my life to the Lord and walk away from the lifestyle I've been living. And it was just amazing. Now, it doesn't always work that way, but you know, God wants to connect people. But when it does work That's that right, way. That's right. It's amazing. God wants to connect yeah. with people yeah. because everybody's broken. Everybody needs a touch from the Lord. And, and so oftentimes, if we're Looking at the culture around us, we as believers want to engage boldly, and we do need to engage boldly, but it cannot come apart from brokenness that really wants to touch people with compassion in the love of Jesus Christ. Why is it so hard to get there? You know, it, I, I will say sure. I felt like a lesser Christian. If, if, yeah, I had I, gotten, yeah. if I had gotten a message like that, I don't know if I would have done anything. Yeah, well, you, you, we look at Scripture, and, and this is 28 chapters filled with stories, so it's very practical. And, and we talk about several Scriptures, and the one uh, case study is the life of Peter. And you see what happened with Peter in the garden when he was asleep and he was awakened to the captors that were coming for Christ. What did he reach for? A sword, sword. Yeah. yeah. So that's what happens with us. And when he takes that dude's ear off, Jesus instantly says, no. We're, look, your response cannot be to harm people, not to hurt, but to heal. So we have to, as believers, our first, as we're waking up and realizing, oh my goodness, look at this spiritual battle that's waging in this nation. New York City expanding their abortion laws. I mean, we're redefining marriage and redefining gender. and People are gripped by an identity of their feelings and passions. And man, we really need to speak the truth in love, but we can't awaken to this and reach for a sword and hurt people. No, we want to bring healing. And so that's Peter the bully. But then on the other side, just a few verses later, you see... Peter, now Jesus is walking to the cross and he's following him at a distance. He's beginning to distance himself now. And then a young girl says, hey, I know you were with him. And three times he denies the Lord. That's mm -hmm. Peter the bystander. But then in the book of Acts, after the Holy Spirit comes, all of a sudden Peter arises to his feet and speaks boldly with a heart of compassion and has been broken and boom. That's now the rest is history. God used him as a bridge. All right, Jason, back to you. I'll give you a bridge <laughs> from what David was saying. We just are, are seeing what I never thought I would see in my life, where you have legislation that says a child can be born alive and it's still okay to kill that child. 
How, how do you reach that? Well, that's the culture of death. You know, and, and we see that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. This is the moment where the church should stand and be the leading voice that says, look, all life is sacred from conception all the way through to death. All life is sacred. And so on st stuff like this that's happening, what we see is the, the ceiling always becomes the floor. There was a time where they said, you know, we just want abortion up to six months. And now all of a sudden we see what's happening. But that's why it takes bold believers to actually stand up and say, no, wait a second. God is the one who creates life, defines life. And we have a responsibility to protect all human life. We need to start talking about it. That's number one, is that we just be willing to actually enter the conversation. If we get there, we'll, we'll be surprised at what God does. Okay. <laughs> it's got me. It's got me mad. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Know, I, that's a righteous indignation. It's, that's a... it's like you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Uh, what have we come to? And it's gotten me looking at some Old Testament judgments that sure. happened when Israel started sacrificing their children. You know, one of the things that we did is is uh, we were asked to speak at the Day of Mourning at the Capitol in Albany. Um, in New York, and we, we actually had a moment of mourning. This was a time where we shouldn't be rejoicing over these things. We should, you know, because these legislators well, in standing, New York were... Standing ovation for Yeah, them. and then you and then light up the building. blessing over it. Yeah, no. So we have to, as the church, we are the salt and the light. We are the ones that have to respond to that. So we went to the day of mourning. But from that position of mourning, we now need to lead to action because it's one thing to be against abortion. It's another thing to be pro-life. There are mothers that are out there that feel an overwhelming majority of them, they feel that abortion is their only choice. Yeah, and we're like, no, 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 no. There's no, no option no, no. for me. There are a myriad of options for you, but the church can't be like the priest and Levite in Luke 10 walking by on the other side of the ditch. The, you know, they're, they're over there on the other side of the road. They might have preached a great sermon or prayed a great prayer about the man in the ditch, or maybe one day a, a, mo a year held up sanctity of man in the ditch Sunday. <laughs> and while, while I go to those marches, it's vital that we get down into the ditch and really help our neighbors. But this is where spiritual leaders need to take the lead. You see, Gordon, we're at a, hu we're at a huge problem you know, in our culture when our spiritual leaders, their income, their influence, and their image is all tied to people liking them. When you're there, we're in big trouble. We need for our spiritual leaders and, and all of us to individually to actually lay those things on the altar and realize that any platform that we have, that's not just meant for you to stand on. It's meant for you to lay on as an altar and let it burn. Let it burn. That we're willing to stand and say, no, all human life is sacred. Look, God defines marriage. We can't redefine marriage. And we start talking like that. What we'll discover is a lot of us will lose our platforms. So be it. But we'll stand for the truth and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. And that's to set people free. Yeah. You're speaking from example. You did that. Mm -hmm. You absolutely God. did that. And let's, let's just pray in agreement that yeah. we can have a culture where every mother wants their children. Yes. Yes. And wouldn't that be a great yes. thing? Yes. Amen. And let's incentivize that. That's right. Let's praise mothers. Let's congratulate them mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a, it's a risk on there. You're, you're actually saying there's hope for the future. That's right. There's hope for my, my children and let's give them that hope. Yes. Amen. Amen. The Amen. book is called Bold and Broken, Becoming the Bridge Between Heaven and Earth. It's available wherever books are sold. And David and Jason, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Still ahead, a man born with no arms asks God a question. God, how am I going to have joy when I know my situation, my physical situation is not going to get any better? Daniel Ritchie shares the Bible verse that changed his perspective right after this. Daniel Ritchie was born with no arms. So when it comes to everyday tasks like brushing his teeth, combing his hair, making coffee, he uses his feet, and even though Daniel learned to live independently, he still felt incomplete until he discovered the secret of contentment. Hey guys, my name is Daniel Ritchie, and I want to take a couple minutes just to share with you about what it means to be content in Christ, because that's something I have struggled with my entire life, because I was born without arms, and I look around and I see the rest of everybody in my life. Uh, living life with hands and, and using their thumbs. And I look at what I do and who I am, and, and, and I'm not that. And I know that, that my situation is never going to get better. And so I sit here and go, God, how am I going to have joy? How am I going to have peace when I know my situation, my physical situation is not going to get any better? And I love what, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. He just says, I've learned to be content 
in, in whatever I'm in, whether I have nothing, whether I have everything. And he goes on to say in, in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And that's coming from a guy who writes those words as he sits in a prison cell, not knowing if he's gonna live or die, but he can say, I can be content in whatever I'm in. And it's simply because of Jesus. And that was something for me that I started to realize that my contentment doesn't come from having arms. My contentment doesn't come in my life getting better. My contentment is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. That's the only thing that doesn't change. That's the only thing that doesn't go away. He's my hope in this life and in the next. And so if you're sitting there right now and thinking, God, my situation is not going to get any better. How is there hope in this? Our hope isn't in this life. Our hope isn't in pain going away. Our hope is in Jesus, in his love for us, in his plan to use us, even in our pain, knowing that one day when faith becomes sight, our pain goes away. It's the hope of our calling. Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. And it's sometimes hard to get that contentment part. The godliness, uh, that can be hard too, and that comes from a belief, and a belief that Jesus died for you, that he paid the price so that you wouldn't have to, that together we died with him, and together we were raised to new life in him. So that godliness equation, God has taken care of all of that. That contentment is up to us. And so the question we all have to ask ourselves, is the cross sufficient? Do I need something more to make me happy? Do I need something more than my relationship with God, my security in knowing that I will be with him for all eternity? When you look at it that way, now contentment gets very easy. And then you get to the point where you say, yes, God, this is great gain. Here's a word for you. I have learned the secret of being content in, any, in every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength.